little boy was sick on Palm Sunday and stayed home from church with his mother. When his father returned from church, he came home holding a palm branch. The little boy was curious and asked, why do you have a palm branch, dad? You see, and this is what the dad responded, you'd see when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got palm branches today. So the little boy replied, the only Sunday I miss is the Sunday that Jesus shows up. <laughs> um, again, it's, it's a little funny story. I think the kids are just interesting to say most interesting things, but um, yes, Jesus is here with us and he, he will show up. He is here with us. So when uh, you ever hear someone, some kid tell, asking you that or telling you that, you can say, yeah, he was there. So, um, so on this Palm Sunday, um, I'm going to be reading to you or, and explaining to you John's account of Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Now, you may, some of you are really familiar with this story. May, you may know it by memory, like back of your hand. Um, but I think, again, you may learn a thing or two here with this message that I prepared for you all. And if you have never heard this story, well, I think, you know, there's a lot that you can learn. There's a lot here um, that you may or may not be aware of. And so, again, what I believe you'll be learning today, what I, the lesson here you'll be learning today is, is the significance of Palm Sunday and why we celebrate it as Christians. And so again, if this is a question that you've always had, like why, what's the big deal about Palm Sunday? Well, I think today's message will, will explain that, will you know, answer those, some of those questions. So we, before we get into our passage this morning that we're, that we're going to be reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to talk to us, speak to us this morning through his word. Heavenly Father, um, you are great, you are awesome, you are amazing, and we are so thankful that you are our God. And that we can call to you at any moment, um, at any time, Lord, and you will be there. You won't turn a deaf ear to us, and you won't ignore us. Lord, you... Time and time again, you've proven how good you are, Lord, and what just the amazing things that you've done in our lives and in the lives of others. And so now on this Palm Sunday, Lord, I pray that you will bless this message, Lord. May people have a new, those listening who never heard it, may they have a, um, learn here what the importance why Jesus had to make that entry into Jerusalem and be able to take something away from it. And, and those, too, who know the story, Lord, I pray that you will also minister to them, that you will speak to them, too, Lord, and teach them new things. So, again, we are thankful that um, for bringing us here all safe and sound, Lord. I pray for those watching and listening that you will also minister to them, that lives will be changed. Lord, and they will, people will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So thank you. We adore you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John chapter 12. John chapter 12 this morning. And we're going to be beginning in verse 13, or 12, I'm sorry, 12, verse 12. John chapter 12, verse 12. The Word of God says, The next day, 
when the large crowd had come to the festival, to the festival, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept sh shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. There are a few details in this first verse of this passage that we just read that um, I just want to share with you. I want to begin with and share with, share with you. Now first, verse 12 begins with the phrase, the next day. So in case you're wondering what this next day refers to, well, the first 11 verses explain that. They tell you that, what had happened just the day before. But rather than read that to you, I'll just give you a quick summary of what it says there. Now, beginning in verse 1 and all the way through, through verse 11, we see that Jesus went to Bethany and had dinner with uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And another Mary shows up and anoints Jesus' feet with some really expensive oil. We then learn that Judas made a comment saying, essentially, you know, why are you wasting that? That the money, you could have sold that and that money could have been used for other things or for, you know, the ministry, basically. And then what does Jesus do? He, he stops her, he rebukes her and says, hey, just leave her alone. Leave her alone. And also there, we also learn that the chief priests were plotting to kill Lazarus because he was a big hindrance in, in, their, in them wanting to, to stop Jesus. They knew that if he wasn't around anymore, it'd be easier just to, to, to go after Jesus. But because Lazarus was alive, he had been raised from the dead, it was harder to do that. And so in a, I guess in a nutshell, that's what we see in these first 11 verses. Um, Again, that's a you know, quick summary for me. I'm sure there's, I missed a few things there, but I'd rather not get into it all that right at this very moment. But now all of this seems to have happened on Saturday. And so the next day here, Paul refer, probably refers to Sunday of Passion Week. And is also typically known as Palm Sunday. So today basically marks the beginning of Passion Week. And, um, and will eventually culminate in next week's Easter Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. For Jewish people though, this Sunday also marks the beginning of one of the most important festivals of the year. This festival that's mentioned also in verse 12 is the next detail I want to briefly go over. Now there are three main festivals that the Jews are obligated to observe. The Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. However, of the three, Jews from all over the world try to make every effort to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. 
In fact, to this day, when Jews in foreign lands observe the Passover, they say, this year here, next year in Jerusalem. And so back in Jesus' day, it was common for Jerusalem and the surrounding villages just to be at max capacity. It was just full of people from all over the place. Just Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that on one occasion, a census was taken of the lambs that were killed at the Passover feast, and that number was counted as 250, 250, 256,000 lambs. Now, if that number is accurate, that would mean that there had to have been a minimum of 10 people per lamb. And if you do the math, which I'm glad someone else did because I'm horrible at math, that would mean that there must have been almost 3 million people there in Jerusalem and in the surrounding villages at that Passover feast. Now, just to give you an idea of how crowded it must have been, the population here in El Paso is roughly 600,000. Now, can you imagine what it would be like if three million visitors came for the week? You think you'd be able to go out and eat at your favorite restaurant and be able to be seated right away? Probably not. All the hotels would be full. Um, it just would be crowded to finally see those, you know, probably the traffic here that I was used to seeing in California. Maybe some of you have seen in other places, but it would be hectic out here. So again, can you imagine what it would be like to have three million, three million visitors here? But e so even if that census, the census of those animals, of those lambs, was exaggerated, it's still very likely that these numbers, these, all these people here, must have been immense. Now, the third detail in verse 12 that I want to touch on is the reason Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And simply put, the time had now come for Jesus to challenge his opponents openly by a clear and public demonstration that he was Israel's Messiah. But by showing up in Jerusalem, it really also sure showed how courageous he was. So, see, even though he was a wanted man by the authorities, and even though he knew that he, what was going to happen to him, he still went there willingly. Not only did he know that he would be killed, he knew who, where, when, and how it would be done. But most importantly, he knew why. And so rather than playing the victim or submitting to the power of Rome, Jesus chose to submit to the will of the Father. He submitted to the plan that was set in place before the foundation of the world. A plan that Jesus perfectly understood as he walked into it. A plan that included both crucifixion and resurrection. So he willingly went to Jerusalem. Now, the following verse, verse 13, is significant, is significant because it tells us why we as Christians call this day Palm Sunday. But in this verse, I want to also clarify a few things. Now, I used to believe, before I you know, really studied the Bible, before I was, you know, new things as a Christian, um, I, that the crowd that met Jesus um, were meeting him as he was entering the temple there in the, in the city. But as I heard Bible studies, as I started going to church and I started hearing messages about Palm Sunday and what it was all about, 
came to find out, I came to found, find out that um, that's not why, that's not where they went out to meet him. They didn't go meet him at there at the entrance to the temple. Temple. They actually met him outside the city, along a path that came from Bethany, because that's where he was staying at with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, down to the Mount of Olives, into the Kindred Valley, to Jerusalem. Now, some of your Bibles might have maps. It might tell you where Jesus' path uh, went or to Jerusalem. But but yeah, that's the path that they met him at, right outside the city. So in other words, they met him right before he entered the city of David. And so it says there that this crowd took palm branches. Well, have you ever wondered why palm branches? Why palm branches and why not, why not roses? Why not tulips? Why not, you know, why palm branches? Well, I did some research and here's what one author said. From the time of the Maccabees, palms or palm branches had been used as a national symbol. Palm branches figured in the procession which celebrated the rededication of the temple in 164 BC, and again when the winning of full political independence was celebrated. Under Simon in 141 BC, um, well, under Simon under, in 141 BC, later palms appeared as, a, as national sim- symbols on coins struck by Judean insurgents during the first and second revolts against Rome. So basically, since the time of the Maccabees, palm branches was a symbol of deliverance, um, uh, deliverance from oppression, and Jewish nationalism. So whenever there was a patriotic type event, a parade or something like that, the, the people spontaneously celebrated by waving palm branches. Now, here, though, in John's account, 200 years after Maccabees, the Jews find themselves oppressed again, not by the Syrians, but by the Romans. So the crowd saw Jesus. They weren't really looking at him as a spiritual savior. They were looking at him as a political and national savior who would rescue and free them from Roman oppression. So what the people were essentially saying when they kept saying Hosanna and waved palm branches as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they were basically saying this, deliver us, rescue us, save us from the Romans. But while they were saying, while they were doing this, In Luke chapter 19, verses 37 through 44, we're told there that Jesus was weeping. The people were hoping that Jesus would bring them the peace that they needed. However, Jesus wept. He wept because he saw what lay ahead of the nation. (coughs) War, suffering, destruction, and a scattered people. Here's the thing, though. It didn't take long for most of those people praising Jesus to turn against them. See, they soon realized Jesus had a different agenda than a political one, a different agenda than a national one. When they began to see that he had a different agenda than a material one, Their cry changed from Hosanna to crucify him. If you think about it, same is still true. Christians individually and in churches corporately mobilize politically for this cause or for that personality to change our government or to change our economy. But very few are interested in a cross that speaks 
of dying to the self. An arresting picture of Calvary depicts three empty crosses at Golgotha with a donkey in the background chewing on a palm fond. You see, it's one thing to shout at a parade and it's something else altogether to stand at the foot of the cross. Well, in verse 14, John seems to pause the story in order to make a personal comment about an important Old Testament, Old Testament prophecy that was fulfilled. He references Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And there in that verse in Zechariah, it says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So now, if you want to know some cool details on how the disciples acquired the donkey, I recommend reading the first part of Mark chapter 11. Matthew also has the story, and so does Luke, but here I just wanted to mention Mark chapter 11. We're told there exactly what happened, how Jesus acquired that donkey. But by entering into the city in this way, two claims were established. First, it was a deliberate claim from Jesus that he was the promised Messiah that Zechariah the prophet spoke about in, in that verse in Zechariah 9.9. Although it speaks of a king, everybody knew that this king passage was referring to the Messiah. But second, it was a claim to be a particular kind of Messiah. So we mustn't misunderstand this picture. With us, the donkey is it's an ugly animal. It's lowly, it's despised, it's stubborn. But in the East, it was a noble animal. Judges 10.4 says that Jair, Jair, the judge, had 30 sons who rode on donkeys. The book of 2 Samuel tells us that Ahithophel rode upon a donkey, and Mephibosheth, the royal prince, the son of Saul, came to, da to David riding upon a donkey. The point is that the king came upon riding, that a king came upon riding a horse when he was bent on war. He came riding on a donkey when he was coming in peace. This action of Jesus is a sign that he was not the warrior figure men, the, the warrior figure men dreamed about, but the prince of peace. Before moving on to the last few verses of this passage, I want to share with you again another story, a story illustration that has a good lesson that we can all learn from. And that story is called From a Donkey. The donkey awakened, his mind still savoring the afterglow of the most exciting day of his, of his life. Never before had he felt such a rush of pleasure and pride. He walked into town and found a group of people by the well. I'll show myself to them, he thought. But they didn't notice him. They went on drawing their water and paid no mind. Throw your garments down, he said crossly. Don't you know who I am? They just looked at him in amazement. Someone slapped him across the tail and ordered him to move. Miserable heathens, he muttered to himself. I'll just go to the market where the good people are. They will remember me. The same thing happened. No one paid attention to the donkey as he stuttered down the main street in front of the marketplace. The palm branches, 
Where are the palm branches, he shouted. Yesterday you threw palm, branch, palm branches. Hurt and confused, the donkey returned home to his mother. Foolish child, she said gently. Don't you realize that without him, you're just an ordinary donkey? And just like the donkey who carried Jesus to Jerusalem, we're most fulfilled when we are in service of Jesus Christ. Without him, all our best efforts are like filthy rags and amount to nothing. When we lift up Christ, however, we're no longer ordinary people, but key players in God's plan to redeem the world. So now I move on to verses 16 and 18. And there in verse 16, we're told that uh, although they were well taught by Jesus, the disciples still didn't fully understand the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. When uh, Jesus came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, the palm branch waving and the shouts of Hosanna it didn't really mean anything to the disciples. They kind of just went over their head. They were, oh, that's nice. That's cool. They are shouting and, you know, they, you know, they're shouting Bible verses. But it didn't mean anything until Jesus was glorified. The failure of Jesus' most intimate and faithful disciples to comprehend the spiritual nature of his kingdom was because they too, they also focused on the idea that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom. They were looking at the physical realm. They were looking at the here and now. Pretty much all of them thought that they were going to be part of this amazing kingdom here on earth, that Jesus was going to come kick the Romans out, and that he was going to make himself king and that they were going to be surrounding him there on his throne. That's what they were focused on. They weren't seeing the bigger picture. It wasn't until after the resurrection and Jesus' ascension up to heaven that the, that the apostles finally got everything into proper focus and have the full glory of the Savior's glorious work his, his glorious work, it finally dawned upon them. It finally dawned upon their understanding. Oh, okay, I get it. I get it now. I understand. Let me ask you all a question. Are the scriptures confusing to you? When you open up the Bible, is do you understand what you're reading? Or is it confusing? Do they make any sense? Well, keep reading. Keep studying. For as Jesus is glorified in your life, you will have a greater and greater understanding of Scripture. Let me repeat that. Keep reading. Keep studying. And the more you do that, the more Jesus is glorified in your life, you will have more of an understanding of Scripture. One pastor made this comment. The problem is, we want understanding, but we don't want to glorify the Lord by obeying Him. We want to understand esoteric insights. We want to grasp the meaning of this verse or that chapter. But it's only when we glorify the Lord in obedience that we will understand what's being said in any given passage. The disciples didn't understand initially. But when Jesus was glorified, they understood eventually. And so... Can you say today at this very moment that you are glorifying the Lord 
in obedience. If you call yourself a Christian, if you are born again, you know for sure that you are a born again believer. Are you glorifying him in your obedience? Are you reading scripture and hearing, seeing and seeing the words of Jesus when he makes a command? Are you obeying it? When you obey it, when you obey him, you're glorifying him. And as I just said, when you glorify him, you understand his word more and more. So again, if, you, if you're not glorifying him in your obedience, if his words don't mean anything to you, if you, you know, again, see his words and certain command and you're just blowing it off, well, then maybe this is why you're having a hard time understanding the scriptures. In verses 17 and 18, John explains the reason that the crowds went out to see Jesus. And what I find interesting about these two verses is that it was the eyewitness testimony of those who saw Jesus that those who saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead that triggered the appearance of such a large and enthusiastic multitude. They heard from those that were there. When Jesus raised Lazarus, a dead man, he raised Lazarus from the, from the grave. There were witnesses there who saw it. They testified to it. So, the word was getting out. But not just because of that. I mean, he had been teaching now for well over three years. So he had gained a reputation, obviously, for other miracles as well. But this was one of the main reasons why there were so many people there with those palm branches and shouting, Hosanna. So in addition to the possibility that Jesus would usher in a new government it also appears that the crowd was hyped of seeing the one who had the power to work such a miracle. He was greater. By this time, he was greater than any celebrity that ever lived. What do you mean he raised someone from the dead? I got to check this guy out. I got to go. Maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe... Yeah, the Messiah is supposed to bring a new, usher in a new government. Yeah, forget these Romans. Man, we're finally going to have a kingdom. We're finally going to be ruled by the Messiah. They were pretty excited to see him. Now, I want to spend just a quick minute on... Lazarus. This text here tells us three things about him. First, Jesus had raised him from the dead. Second, he was reclining at a table in fellowship with the Lord who had raised him from the dead. We see that in verse 2 of this chapter. Third, his resurrected life resulted in many coming to see him and believing Jesus as a result. Some scholars say that these were just curious seekers and not genuine converts. But John doesn't say that. He just says in verse 11, on account of him, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now in this, Jesus, uh, Lazarus, is an example for our witness, for your witness as a believer. First, Christ has to give you new life before you can be a witness for him. Granted, our transformation is probably not as dramatic and as a physical resurrection from the dead. But people should see a definite change in your life after you're born again. 
Do you remember the kind of life that you used to live before you were born again? Well, once you are, once Jesus gives you new life, everything that people knew you as before, it's, they're going to be telling you, you're, what's wrong with you? You're not the same person you used to be. You're going to get those kind of comments one way or another. People stop hanging out with me. All the people I used to drink with and hang out with and party with, you know, they, they don't, they stop calling me. And it wasn't a, it was a gradual change for me, but they started noticing that it wasn't participating in a lot of their activities and a lot of the things I used to. But even then, if you ask any of my, you know, old Marine buddies, they will probably tell you the same thing. Man, I remember Angel used to do this and that. Remember those days and, you know, and, uh, now if I was to hear something like that, I'd be like, yeah, that was the old me. That's not me anymore. There should be a significant change in your life. Like night and day. That person you once were is dead. You have new life now. New life in Christ. And so if that change isn't there, if people can't tell the difference, you know, there's you gotta do some evaluating in your life. You gotta ask yourself why. Is it because you're ashamed? Is it is it because you just don't want to? You don't want people to know? Could be a number of reasons, but when you're all for him, you're not ashamed of him. You're not going to be ashamed. You're again. There's people are going to see the difference. It's going to be a definite change in your life. Second, you must spend time in fellowship with Jesus, learning from him. Then thirdly, because our Savior came to seek and to save the lost, as you grow to be like Him, pray that God will use you to seek and to save the lost. Wouldn't it be great if we could all put our names in verse 11 and say, because of Isaac, Robin, Daniel, Heather, any of, your, any of your names, many were going away and believing in Jesus. Well, the final verse of our passage, John tells us the religious leaders felt frustrated and helpless. Nothing they could do seemed able to stop the attraction of this Jesus. The whole world, they said, has gone after him. Now, the Pharisees, of course, were exaggerating with this comment. But this comment also uh, is also a magnificent example of the irony in which John is so good at. See, it was because God so loved the world that Jesus came into the world. And here, all unwittingly, his enemies are saying that the world has gone after him. In all of the other three Gospels, we're told that during the Passover week, they want to arrest Jesus, but he carefully avoids them at night. And he stays surrounded by the crowds during the day, making it impossible. I'm inclined to think that this panic of the religious leaders recorded here in our text and the decision of Judas to betray the Lord Jesus, they coincide. I believe Judas decides to betray our Lord at the exact same time the Jews are ready to do whatever it takes to get rid of him. If they could have it their way, it wouldn't be during the Passover because 
this would put them in danger of inciting the masses against them. The last thing they wanted were riots in the city with over three million people in them. But now, as <clears throat> the saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures. In their eagerness to put Jesus to death, even during the Passover, they perfectly fulfilled the will of God and the purpose of our Lord that he die during the Passover as the Passover lamb. Ladies and gentlemen, church, God's timing is always perfect. I feel like it would be wrong of me to end or to end this passage or finish here without reiterating some things that I've already mentioned. Seldom in the world, in world's history, has there been such a magnificent, a display of magnificently deliberate courage at the triumphal entry. We must remember that Jesus was an outlaw and the authorities were determined to kill him. All prudence would have warned him to turn around, to turn back and go to Galilee or in the desert. If he was to enter Jerusalem at all, all caution would have demanded that he enter secretly and go into hiding. But he came in such a way as to focus every eye upon himself. It was an act of most superlative courage, for it was the defiance of, of all that man could do. And it was an act of the most superlative love, for it was love's last appeal before the end. The story of the triumphal entry is one of contrasts. And those contrasts contain applications to you and me. It's a story of the king who came on a lowly serv uh, as a lowly servant on a donkey, not an elegant horse, not in royal robes, but on clothes of the poor and humble. Jesus Christ comes not to conquer, by force, as earthly kings, but by love, grace, mercy, and by his own sacrifice for his people. He is not a kingdom of armies and splendor, but of lowliness and servanthood. He conquers not nations, but hearts and minds. His message is one of peace with God, not of temporal peace. If Jesus has made a triumphal entry into our hearts, he reigns there in peace and love. So as his followers, we exhibit these same qualities and the world sees the true king, living and reigning in triumph in us. There's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me repeat that. A day will come when every single knee includes yours, you will bow down to Jesus and confess that he is Lord. And either you can do that knowing right now that it's true, or you can do it when you're at his judgment, uh, before his judgment seat, saying, Lord, I was wrong. You, you are Lord. You are Savior. At that time, when those who are real, real believers, that's when real 
That's when worship will be real. Also in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, John records a scene in heaven that features the eternal celebration of the risen Lord. And there it says this. He writes this. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. In the following verse, verse 10, these palm branch or palm bearing saints will be shouting this, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. So my question to you all this morning on this Palm Sunday, whether you're here or watching this online or hearing this later on, will you be there with all those saints? Will you be there on your, you know, just glorifying Jesus, praising him? That is going to be in, in heaven there. It's going to be one big, massive worship event. People are going to be singing, glorifying him. That's why it's important we get used to it now. If you get used to singing now, you're not going to be up in heaven saying, oh, uh, I can't sing. I don't have a good voice. No. Sing to him. Sing to him as best as you can. Because you'll be doing a lot of that in, in heaven. Are you, do you know for sure if you're going to be there? Can you say today, right now, at this very moment, that you are 100% certain that you're going to be there glorifying Jesus? glorifying the Lord in heaven? Or will you be cast out as a non-believer? As someone who said, you know, I'm going to live for my life right now at this very moment because that's all that matters. Is that you? Well, if it is, keep in mind that you don't know the day or the hour which he's going to come or when you're, when's your last day here. You can walk out of this room right now, out of this place, and that could be the last day of your life. So if you want that assurance, if you want to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are a child of God, that you will be with him, and I wanna, on this Palm Sunday, I wanna invite you to the cross and become a born-again believer. Become a born-again child of God. Once you do, the message that I will present to you next week will have much more meaning and much more significance to you. you know, I, those who want to be born again, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to do that Well, in a minute, but I hope you can all see the significance of Palm Sunday, why it's so important, why we celebrate it as Christians. It was necessary for Jesus to do that, to go there, to go to Jerusalem. <coughs> and all those people that were praising him that were shouting, Hosanna. They confirmed, whether they knew it or not, that Jesus was the Messiah. And not just them, but also just the, the donkey that he was riding on. It's very significant in our, the, res the Palm Sunday, very significant. 
to understand and to know. And it leads up to, you know, it's the beginning again of this Passion Week that ends with the resurrection of our Savior. But I want to again just invite those who are ready to, to give their lives to the Lord, to be born again, to become children of, of God, to come to the cross and ask for forgiveness. To ask for forgiveness of your sins and receive that forgiveness fr freely. And so if you're ready to do that, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, I want you to pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe now that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I repent, Lord, of everything that I've ever done. All those sins, all those times, I everything from stealing that pen that didn't belong to me or even if whatever sin seemed massive, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. And I do accept that forgiveness now, Lord. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying on the cross and saving me. And now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and show me more about you in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you sincerely pray that, if you really meant that, Again, you're going to start seeing some changes in your life. The person you once were is dead. And a new life has arisen. It's been born again. So what I want to do is invite you to, well, I want you to get hold of us, to let us know how we can help you if you're not sure what where to go from here or what to do next, we can help you in the next steps as a, as a believer, as a Christian, whether it's a church, um, help you find a church wherever you're at, or uh, maybe if it, you need a Bible, we have plenty here, we can give you one, send you one, but uh, we want to hear from you, we want to hear your story, and um, next week is going to be a great message as well, Resurrect, we're going to be celebrating Resurrection the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I invite you also to come join us um, online or here for that. Invite a friend um, if you need to, but it's going to be a great time of here of fellowship and a good time of study and fellowship. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, if you need, again, if you need anything, please let us know. Um, enjoy this Palm Sunday and... We look forward to seeing you all next week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.